Hello, I'm Anna Raimondi, coming to you from the Angel Cooperative in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Welcome to this episode of Talking to the Dead in Suburbia. Today, our guest is my friend, Alan Mankin. Alan Mankin is an American composer, songwriter, music conductor, musical director, and record producer. He is best known for his scores and songs for films produced by Walt Disney Animation Studios. His accolades include eight Academy Awards, a Tony Award, 11 Grammy Awards, seven Golden Globe Awards, and a Daytime Emmy Award. Oh my God, is there anything else that you need in this bio? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do have to say one thing about the bio is wrong. I'm not a conductor. Oh, okay. So, well, so that's the one thing that you're not. About, uh, yes. That's but you know I'm what? Not. If you want it to be, you could be. No, I'm a ter terrible. I'm too impatient. I, I would be pushing the orchestra around as opposed to <laughs> just sitting back and, ha and listening. So anyway. Well, I am thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to have you here. Um, and I know that um, you have so much to tell us that will inspire my listeners. To me, music touches the soul. When I meditate, I put on music. It just, when I hear a certain song on the radio, it just, it can make me cry. It can make me laugh. It makes me right. remember, um, you know? So to me, like the, one of the greatest universal gifts that God has given us is music because it's universal language. So I just want to know, like when you're writing, you know, the scores, you know, for a play or whatever you're doing, do you call on a muse? Do you bring something into you that helps you with that? I, you know, yes, the more I do it, the more I believe that it comes through us. This this kind of kind of gift comes comes through us. We, you know, we have our brain and it filters through our brain, but it comes from somewhere in those moments. Um, and you know, as you develop your skills, you become more receptive to anything that's going to come through you, and know that you can you can filter it and and feel what what needs to come through and what you know, you push aside. Um, and before I open up that portal, those a lot of questions that I have to ask. What's the story we're telling? Who are the characters? What's the world that we're in? What's unique about this world that an audience hasn't heard, you know, or experienced before? You know, why would I want to hear this story sung as opposed to simply spoken? Um, because there are certain things about certain stories that really want to be sung. Um, so I ask, you know, a lot of questions before I then go, okay, I, I feel what this is. And then along with my collaborator in the room, you know, the lyricist or the book writer or the director, whatever it is, we take each song one at a time in, in a story or each moment and discuss what do we want to do with it. And then only then do my fingers go anywhere near near the piano. You know, it's so interesting because Colors of the Wind from Pocahontas, I have played at retreats, I listen to, and it's the music that kind of kind of takes me, you know, where it needs to be. Um, that that whole production to me is very spiritual. Did you feel that when you were writing for it? Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, especially because we were dealing with American Indians and the American Indian culture. Um, and one of the things I love when I write is channeling another, other, another culture, another mindset, um, basically taking the specifics of, of another sort of vocabulary, musical vocabulary, um, and filtering it through me. Um, in this case, it was me and Stephen Schwartz, also our, our neighbor uh, here. He's a, a Richfield resident. Um, and we collaborated on that and, you know, did a lot of listening to American Indian music, which has a percussive quality to it. So when you, when it starts with dum, 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 um, that that it, it, on the piano or that that musical figure sort of comes out of the 
the percussiveness of of a Native American. And then there's a lot that's just is interpretive in it. Um, and it was actually the very first song I wrote in that particular collaboration. So that was really satisfying. Well, that's a good song to start with. What is yeah. your favorite? Do you have a favorite of every now? My least favorite question. <laughs> Anybody probably asked you that. Yeah, I, I'd be interested. I'm really interested when other you know what other people's favorites are. But for me, they're all my children. They're just mm. and by by the way, like children, you know, most of them are grown up. You know, they they and when they grow up and go out into the world, I feel like they're not really even mine anymore. In a way, they belong to other people, and other people take them in and are invested in them. And I, I have I take great pride in them, and I'm happy to you know accept the royalties for having written it or whatever. <laughs> but the truth is, they're they each have their own life. Each song, each score. Um, you know, I guess I would tend to think say that my favorites, you know, are the ones that are most successful, but not not in every case. Um, and sometimes you just can't predict what's going to really uh, resonate in the world. It's so funny because what you're saying, I hear from artists like um, who paint, you know, they, they paint, they paint from their soul and then someone buys it and they have to let their babies go and grow up in a different way. And I think that's true of any part of creativity. You know, it's not just, it's we create for the world. You know, it's not just for universal acceptance. It goes to each one of us so that we can accept it into our lives. So I, I love that. Absolutely love that. Thank um, you. Do you have, um, so wait, before we even go to what you have, can you play us a little bit from Colors of the Wind? Uh, I love that. You think you own whatever land you land on. The earth is just a dead thing you can play. But I know every rock and tree and creature has a life, has a spirit, has a name. You think the only people who are people. the footsteps of a stranger you'll learn things you never knew you never knew have you ever heard the wolf cry to the blue corn moon or ask the great bobcat why he grinned can you sing with all the voices of the That was so wonderful. I get chills every time I hear that song. It's Thank just, you. it's amazing. Thank you. So what have you been doing lately? What do you um, have for you for the future? Uh, well, we have uh, a sequel to Enchanted. I remember the movie Enchanted. It was yes, I do. Amy Adams. Yes, I it's love a, that movie. <laughs> so it was an, an animated uh, ingenue who has a spell put on her and, and is like, you know, dumped into our world in the middle of Times Square. And um, and uh, so, so yeah, this is, I don't know what we're gonna call it. Right now, the, the working title has been Disenchanted, but we'll see. And um, so th that's uh, filming, that's gonna start filming soon. The live action Little Mermaid is actually filming now. Um, in London, but everything's in the UK these days. Uh, I think for tax reasons as well as artistic. Um, a, a new animated um, called Spellbound with John Lasseter's new company. Uh, a musical of Night at the Museum, which Ooh. I'm really excited about. That's fun. Um, it is fun, and and we've really found some deep tap roots in telling that story because it's tap roots about extinction and about um yeah basically extinction and 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 universality of all these life forms that are in the museum that that come to life in it um 
as well as kind of a tribute to the golden age of New York, because, you know, the museum was actually among the people who started it was Teddy Roosevelt and, and his father in 1877. Um, so it's sort of the Gilded Age of New York. A, a stage musical of Hercules, um, which we did in Central Park last year, actually in 19. Um, and a bunch of other things. Well, so you're still doing, you're still doing. That's that's important because you can't stop because I can tell you this, your mother doesn't want you to. <laughs> no, I know my mother doesn't want me to. No, nope, because your mother is saying, good, he needs to take it to the end, just like she did, okay? Because she's saying, she I took it to the end, I took it to the end, and you know that. She's, she's very proud of you. She's proud of all her children, um, but she's saying, I like it because you keep on going. And she's saying, but success isn't what brings you in the money. Success is what makes you feel inside, okay? And respect. Your mother's very into respect. Your father's laughing. He's saying, I know that, I know that, I know that. <laughs> um, and, and they're on each side of you. Like when I was asking you before about your, your muse, you have your mother and your father coming in from both sides, okay? And she's very happy because she couldn't really affect you that way when she was living, but she certainly can do it now. Okay. She does. Um, she does. Now, um, completely. Um, she's also saying that um, she wants you to know that she's around your daughter who's going through a little bit of a roller coaster. Um, she's oh, there. She's there. But she's saying, but she needs you. She needs you and she needs your wife. Okay. Your father there. sitting back and wait a minute. Who played the violin? Well, his father did. Uh, his okay. father. And had the cane, yes. In fact, there was a cane violin that my my grandfather had. Now, all the men in my family were dentists, but that was just yeah. I don't but they know, don't consider they... themselves. That's not what. That's not where they're. No, is. right. They're, they're and that's the Russian part of their soul. The violin. Okay, and, because I'm uh, hearing the violin being played. Okay, um, the violin is being played. It's being played loud. Okay, loud. <laughs> so this is your grandfather. OK, um, he's saying you bring it through and you bring it up. So they're not concerned that you did not become a dentist. OK, I never I never met no. my grandfather. I was well, named after him, but I never, never met him. He's completely and absolutely around you, especially these days. OK, who passed in February? Passed? You mean this Feb no, this no, in the past. Uh, oh, well, my dad and his brother both died on the same day, a year apart on um, February. Okay, in February. Because I'm hearing, um, I pass in February, but I never really leave you. Okay, I never really leave you. Um, your father kind of goes with the flow. You know what I mean? Like he, I don't feel like he gets really hung up. He leaves that to your mother because your well, mother yeah. talks and talks and talks and talks, and your father <laughs> holds space for her. Okay. That, yeah, yeah. That's 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 the way it works. Mom is is a pretty much a force of nature that way, and dad just adored her like. And you're a lot like your mother. You carry your mother and your father in you, but you're a lot like your mother. I know, I know. There's also I know. another man coming through. Um, who's Howard? Howard Ashman. Howard Ashman is was my collaborator who I wrote Little Shop of Horrors, The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin. Howard died before even Beauty and the Beast came out. Um, so Howard is maybe the most influential artist of our generation uh, in, in, in the field of, of musical theater and musical films. Um, and he died very young. It was, it was the AIDS crisis and it just was a tsunami that, you know, wiped away so many people. Howard, um, we, we visit a lot. We used to visit a lot in dreams. Uh, that that kind of stopped. I don't know. I mean, maybe he didn't want to visit me anymore. <laughs> no, I don't think that's it. <laughs> um, but it, it is amazing. And it, 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 more so than any other person, it's like another life began after after he was in this this form. Um, and I know he struggles with wanting to live in the world in which his all these works of his are so important and so acclaimed, and yet he didn't get to live in that world long enough. 
um, probably torn between that and I guess moving on. I don't know how that works, but. Yeah, but he's completely around you. You know, he's not going anywhere. You know, all you have to do is literally say his name. And I feel like you can feel his presence. He's, he's, this is a strong energy. Okay. Oh, oh yes. Oh. There was a doc, there was a documentary done about Howard. Um, it's out on Disney plus, uh, Disney plus now. Um, it's a fantastic documentary about, about him, his life, his creativity and his unfortunate his, and his passing. Uh, very emotional for me and if people are interested in Howard Ashburn they should check it, check out that documentary it's just under the title Howard um wow yeah he he always comes through and um it's uh and the thing it's always just a, amazing to me and I don't know if you are if you know this or understand this I just I don't understand how it works for them I mean, I, part of me thinks, doesn't it, how, I'm sure Howard has better things to do than to check up on me, but I guess life is, life is different after we're past, but I don't, there's so much we don't know about that. Well, you know um, what it is, is, you know, and I, and, and I say this all the time, and it's true. The energy of love is the strongest energy in the universe. So whether you think this energy is God, but that energy is still among and between us and it never, ever dies. So when we pass on, that love continues and we want to be around the people who we've loved. There's an attachment. So people will say, I don't want to bother my father. Like, I don't know what he's doing, but I don't want to bother him. It's, it's, it's not a bother. They want to be around us. They want to help us and they don't want to be forgotten either. Tell me, Okay, I, I know this is, this is a podcast supposedly about me, but I want to see. I want to ask you so many Go questions. Ahead, you can ask me. <laughs> what is you can interview me? What, okay, what is their life in quotes like? On I I know they're sort of here with us, but that that concept is so hard to grasp. It is what is love. what is their life like? Is there a a linear sort of forward motion to that life? like as you know i can tell you what i've been told and what i see so they show me things that they do so that they're validated so if i told you that your father was climbing a mountain you would say that's not my father no but if i say to you i see your father playing the piano which is how i do see your father playing the piano like like really kind of upbeat music you know you would say oh that's my father right um so they show me that to validate. I also think they get involved in that on the other side, their passions, you know, not necessarily what they did for a living, but their passions. They're also in a place that there's no animosity. There's no hate. There's nothing negative. They're in a place of pure love. So they exist in this place of pure love and they're just, they're joy. I mean, keep in mind, they're not in body. Okay, because we're energy. So they're in energy. And it's just this place of pure joy. So it does go on. It's so interesting. And they, you know, like, for instance, my, my, my mother and my father both appear in my dreams. And, and it's not like they come through like these pure celestial <laughs> presence is sometimes they're the pains in the butt they occasionally could be, mm -hmm. or, or, you know, fussy or whatever, or but and there they are in my dreams as, as a, you know, a part of my life. Um, and I have to filter out what is me creating them in my dream and what is them really being them in my dream. Anyway, it's one of those unknowns, oh, I guess. Difference. There's a difference, okay? Um, you're not making it up. So there's a difference between spiritual visitations and you know, psychological dreams or projection dreams. Um, when it is a spiritual visitation, there is so much love. First of all, they retain their personalities, okay? Oh yeah. So that people pass on and all of a sudden they're so light and, and, and godlike or angelic. That's not true. I don't feel that. They retain their personalities. They work on the things in their lives that maybe weren't so wonderful, but they still retain their personality. So when coming through a dream, yeah, so your mother's a little little bit of 
a nudge, okay? She's, I mean, I feel her, I know. You know, she's, I, a, little, she's a little pushing, okay? So she'll come through in your dreams um, and she'll still be that person, but you'll feel loved. So you'll wake up and you'll feel like, oh, mom, you were here. That's a spiritual visitation. I mean, here, here's another example that I'm gonna say to you and I'll say this to Howard. This, there's no question, Howard was the most, is the most magical voice uh, to work with as a songwriter. Um, his lyrics jump off the page and, and, and a world comes through with them of specificity, of emotional depth, of, of um, empathy, of intelligence. They're just incredible. And I crave, I want, you know, now I have very I have wonderful lyricists now that I work with, but I still want Howard back in front of me, and you know, I had the experience after Howard passed. Um, it, besides working with me, he had worked with Marvin Hamlish, the late Marvin Hamlish on a um, musical called Smile. And um, after Marvin passed away, I was doing one of these concerts at Disneyland, a D23 concert, right? And I thought, you know something, it would be great if what, they had one of the songs in Smile was called Disneyland. I said, I'm going to perform Disneyland. I'll sing it. It's not my song, but just for Howard and for Marvin, I want to sing this song. So I took I took out, a, like, I went to the internet and I, I printed out the lyrics to, to Disneyland. I knew the music, but I wanted to make it sort of my own in terms of just interpretation. And for the first time in 15, maybe 20 years, I sat in front of a Howard Ashman lyric. And there was just, you know, one of those moments where it's a rush of, of just a memory of what it was like to sit in front of a Howard Ashman lyric for the first time and with Howard in the room. And I just broke down. It just but that's broke. What it's all about it. They move our souls. Okay. So whether, and, and often it brings up those emotions and part of that emotion is I feel you here and yet I crave you, you know, um, you know, when you say his name, the word mellifluous comes through to me. It's just, it's just who he is. Okay. And, and I don't know anything about him. You know, I have not seen the documentary. Watch it. Watch it. <laughs> I don't think I get Disney too, or whatever you mentioned. Disney I, plus you Disney don't do streaming. Plus. You don't get Netflix. Oh, and, I do. Well, Disney is seven bucks a month. I'll, I'll, I'll pay. I'll lend you the bucks. Get it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I have a better idea. I'll send you the documentary. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. Yeah, but anyway, you know, he comes through very almost like frosting on a cake. You know what I mean? You know, that's how he comes through, and that's how I feel like he wants to be remembered. He's the flow, okay? But he does work through you. Okay. And it's, I know. once you recognize it, you're going to feel him a lot more. Okay. Just claim it. It's, it's what it's, you know, it's, it's important. He's so happy with what you have attained. Okay. In terms of these, you know, the Grammy, the, the Emmys, the Tonys, you know, yeah. the, whatever else you've, you know, all these big awards, he's very happy because you deserve it. Okay. Oh, oh. But I want to ask you, what does it feel like? Like, what does it feel like to get 11 Grammy Awards? Um, I mean, that's like pretty wild. Yeah, 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 it's wild. And it's it's a little unreal. It, it feels like I've tapped it, you know, basically I've been privileged to tap into something that's had a big impact uh, on people. Um, and it's a little unreal. Um, truly it is. It's, um, I think, you know, when you win awards like that, or you get that kind of acclaim, it, it really is incumbent upon us not to take it onto ourselves. Um, that you're really doing yourself a disservice if you go, Oh, right. This is, this is me because in a way it's, you're getting love from these, from these people who are honoring you. Um, I mean, it's a political aspect to it too, and there's a business aspect to it, but there's a lot of just that, that acknowledgement 
and um, you just want to give it back. Uh, you know, give it back, not not reject it, but take it in and and give it back. It's very hard. Like one of the hardest things for, for me in life is getting up and doing one of those speeches. Um, because I feel like it's important that I acknowledge everyone else who was involved with that, which means instead of going up there with an open heart and just saying how much it means to me, I end up going up there with a list yeah. and saying, I, I want to thank you. And I want to thank you. And I want to thank you. And, um, which is, it's a conflict because people do want to know just in that moment, how it feels for you and how happy it makes you. And at the same time, you really owe it to the people who were not getting these awards, who were part of what you did to just share it with them. So it's, these awards are a responsibility as well as a, you know, a pleasure. But how much do you think I am so blessed and I have to give gratitude above you know, oh my I, God! Not only you know these people came into your life, you were able to collaborate with these people because you were brought together um, by the universe. And where does the ultimate gratitude go? Yeah, it, it goes to the to the universe. It goes to something so much bigger than us. You know, I'm not a big God person. I don't know what God <laughs> is. Mm -hmm. Right. I just know that um, we are part of something bigger and, th and that's why th these things are able to, you know, come through us. Um, when I was a kid, I was very ADD. I was, um, uh, I, I couldn't concentrate at school. I knew I wasn't, I wasn't going to become a musician or a composer because I wasn't practicing piano as much as I should. I, I just wanted to, I just was a dreamer and I would just want to do, you know, whatever I wanted to do. Um, and made my parents very nervous. But I actually got a peptic ulcer when I was a kid, literally at 11, I had a peptic ulcer. Oh my God, that's horrible. <laughs> and then, it, you know, what pushed you forward, I mean, it, it pushed you forward though, in some well, way. Well, yeah, I was built because I couldn't accept that flow that needed to come through me. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, and then I went, you know, when I was in college, I went as a pre-med, I was no way I wanted to be a doctor. And as you know, we were in the, that was, it was the sixties. And as, as we all did in the sixties and me to excess, I began just smoking a lot of pot and, and taking these trips and doing, you name it. I did it. I was, you know, doing everything until I met Janice, who, by the way, another thing about, I dreamt Janice before I met her. Um, so I knew who she was. And I, I, you know, I was just, just waiting to meet her. Um, and when I met Janice, this is now we're going on 50 years together. Um, uh, that just, opened me up completely emotionally. Um, so, and then I realized that it was not about practicing piano and learning all the notes and studying hard. It was about knowing that the thing that you're passionate about um, and the thing that you want to do every day, that is what you're supposed to be doing. Um, and the sooner you realize that, the, the more you can hone that in yourself. Sorry, I right, stopped talking to you. Siri, I don't know, I must have said something that sounded like Siri and it started to talk <laughs> to me. I said, I didn't get that. Um, <laughs> um, but that's, so for me, it's all like a dream. It's like, how did this happen? You know, who is this person? Who is this person that's doing all this? But you um, know, what you're describing is, is the symptoms of an old soul, okay? Um, you know, you're born into this world, you have a gift, 
you fight the gift. Many old souls do this, okay? They get themselves sick. Many old souls have ADHD or ADD. You know, many of them want to escape, self-medicate it. Big dreamers, okay? I um, mean, like you said, who is this person? You know, that's your soul saying, who is this person? And what am I supposed to do with this? You know, and whether you reach the pinnacle where you're, you know, you're getting Academy Awards and stuff like that, or whether it's an old soul who helps community, it, it, it's our path, you know? And so you're an old soul, you know, and you brought it forward and you needed Janice, you needed her to ground you. You know, again, the universe brought you guys together. And then at some point you sit back and you look at your life and you say, oh, wow. This is a series of events that I could not predict, but I could dream about because yeah, the dream yeah. is in your soul. Yeah. And it's hard. You know, I watch my daughters who both have big, big, big dreams of what they want to do with their lives. But in a way, because of they look at how I did it and, and it complicates it for them. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and I can't, you can't, every, when you, anyone who takes this journey really has to do it in their own mm -hmm. way and by their own rules. And you can sort of try to gently keep them on, I think, help them be on the, with the path they need to be on. But truth is, it's their path. It's their journey. It's their, their journey. it's, yeah, it's, I, I, um, you know. But thank you about the old soul thing. It's, um, I do feel, you know, a chorus around me of, of the composers that I love and the artists that I love um, and the eras of time that I love. And that's one of the things that come through in my scores is you want to bring a world through so that people can sort of taste and smell and feel that world. And music has a way of sort of guiding you into another space. Um, that's why so many musicals are not of the most contemporary musical form. They pull on music that might be classical or from another culture because people want to be transported to someplace they haven't been before. Yeah, and that's why that movie, Midnight in Paris, was such a success. Have you seen that movie? You talk about the, the Woody Allen? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, because he, he was transported back in time, you know? Yes. And, you know, not only do we, are we interested in that, but because we've been reincarnated, a lot of us had lived through those periods of time. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it's absolutely. easy to bring it forward because it's part of our soul makeup. We were there. You know what's so interesting? I don't know how you feel about this. You know, we lose people and, and we mourn. We mourn a, a person's passing. Yes, we do. But what I really mourn is not the person's passing because I feel it's natural. It's what has to happen. We're, it's okay. We're all going to do that, go through this transition. And I still will feel them. I mourn that the world of that that I that was there, all of everything that was in that world that will never that I feel like will never be again unless of course I imagine it. Um, but yes, exactly that. It's not a person as much as all the interrelatedness of a particular time. Um, that is so rich, you know. I, I I'll I'll put on sometimes um, the songs. I, there's a I don't know a record of of a Stair and Rogers playing some of those great old Gershwin tunes or or um, uh, Rogers and Hart or and I'll go. This was the contempt. This this is a song that my that my mom and dad fell in love to. This was the, this was their pop music. It was young and everything was vibrant and beautiful. And in that time, it was, and it always will be fresh and new in that perspective. And there's, but there's always a little bit of heartache of that's not the world we're in right now. Right now we're in another world. And the older we get, 
um, in a way that that the center of that world becomes younger, and we who are older are sort of <laughs> holding a lot of worlds together. Yeah. But you know what's sad is I find, I, I think it was, there was a Broadway show on Jimmy Cagney, James Cagney. Is he the yeah. one saying it's a grand old flag? George M. it was called. Yes. It's I, a grand old flag. Yeah. Right. I brought, I brought my old, my 30 year old son to that. And he's like, who's this man? He's like, he's sitting there Googling it on his phone. And I'm like, how could you not know who this is? You know, so we have to keep that alive. Every generation needs to keep it alive so that people do know that this existed and this is what was brought to us, you know? You know, and music is so at a standstill right now. I don't know, I don't get music. All I know is that my kids listen to my music, you know? So they're listening to music from the seventies. Yeah, yeah. Their music today is, I don't know, it's not developing the way it developed in the past. No, I think, yeah, there's, it, I mean, it's there and it's, it, but we, yeah, it's all being synthesized together yeah. in a, in, in, in the world where I think all the advances and it, I mean, social media has sort of become in a way the music of our time. And we're still trying to figure out what to do with that what is that and it's it's a it's both an exciting new time and also a daunting new time because of um the interrelatedness of all of this and it feel, feels like the world is opening up so fast oh god yes now the world is blowing open completely blow we're into um a whole new part of our evolution you know, yeah. as people, as souls, I mean, you know, this, the whole thing with the pandemic kind of helped us sit back and say, who am I? What is this about? And how do I fit in? You know, if there's so many changes and I really hope people remember, you know, because people tend to get out of the place and then say, yeah, hey, I'm done. You know, no, 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 we're not done. We're going oh, no. forward in a really big way. And I'm really it's, excited that you're still creating, that you're not going to stop. You're not, you're never, you're never going to stop. It's not who you are. It's not who you're supposed to be. And you really are an old soul. And your throwback to what attracts you from the past, you've lived them. You know, I tell people all the time, like, it's not random that you're attracted to, you know, the 1920s or the 1850s. There's a reason. You live yeah. then, and if you're bringing it through, we're not supposed to, quote unquote, remember our past lives. Yet, as a hypnotherapist, you know, I sometimes bring people to that place. But it's about what, what, why are we here now? What didn't we learn, and how do we go back and kind of look at what we did and how we did it, or how the world was, and where we are now? That's really important because it's all part yeah. of our makeup. Yeah. And you're right, yeah. you cannot, you know, your children, it's their journey. It's so hard as a parent. It's so hard not to step onto that path and say, let me save you. <laughs> yes, me, I know. Let me do it, you know, yeah, but you think know. about your parents, you know, and I think about my parents, you know, we had our journeys. We had to do it our way through the ups and the downs and the peptic ulcers. And, you know, in my case, you know, going the wrong way into business and suffering through that, we had to do it our way because that's what makes us who we are. And it makes us human and able to speak to people and it helps you write music from your heart. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's what it's about. And we all thank you. Um, you know, I speak for millions, I'm sure, because what you do is so important. Again, music to me is so healing and it's our saving grace. And it's how we connect universally. It's wonderful. No, thank, thank you, Anna. and right back at you. I gotta say, right back at you. No, well, thank you. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, please like, share, and comment, and be sure to subscribe to our channel so you never miss an episode. Thank you so much, Alan. I so appreciate you coming on and all your words, and I just love you. Thank you. <laughs>